Welcome to the first episode of Into the Anthropocene. I'm your host, Byron Pace, and I'm going to be guiding you through the fascinating, if complex, world of conservation and environmental stewardship. From grappling with controversial topics like trophy hunting to the global impacts of invasive earthworms in the Arctic, if it has anything at all to do with our understanding of science in the natural world, we're going to dig into it. I hope you will continue to join me every two weeks as I speak with scientists, environmental advocates, conservationists, wildlife managers, and a diverse array of global guests to uncover the complex nature of the world we live in. Into the Anthropocene aims to make the science of conservation more accessible by exploring stories and research from the front lines. I really believe that only through the understanding of our world can we improve our decision-making and define the Anthropocene for the betterment of humanity and the planet. If you find yourself unable to wait two weeks for a new show, well, fear not. This podcast is actually being launched on the back of the Into the Wilderness podcast, which I've been hosting for the last five years. So you can head over there for long-form conversations with an eclectic mix of fascinating people from the outdoors space, from explorers to conservationists and everything in between. Search Into the Wilderness on any podcast app, and you should be able to find it. And lastly, before we jump into this show, which is all about the reintroduction of sea otters, these podcasts wouldn't be possible without our Patreon supporters. So if you enjoy these, please consider heading over to patreon.com forward slash Byron Pace, where you can pledge as little as a dollar a month for the production of these shows. Now, that's not even a cup of coffee, and uh, every dollar makes a massive difference. If you want to dig into extra show notes and other information about projects that I'm involved in, be that uh, photography or filmmaking, which is the other side of the, the work that I do, then you can head over to all the W's, byronpace.com. That's B-Y-R-O-N pace.com. Now, into the show. And we are transporting ourselves to the coast of British Columbia, to the archipelago of Hadaguay, which means islands of the people. Sometimes referred to as the Galapagos of Canada, it's located about 40 miles from the mainland and is jointly managed by the Hada Nation and the Canadian government through an institution called the Archipelago Management Board and has equal representation from both parties. It once boasted a lush underwater ecosystem, abundant enough in food to support the local populations that lived there. But today, it is a sea urchin barren more on what that means shortly. This is a story of population dynamics and the interconnectedness between species. It starts at the height of the fur trade back in the 18th and 19th centuries, which decimated wild sea otter populations, extirpating them along much of their historic range. Today, populations have started to recover in certain locations along the mainland and Vancouver Island, and it's expected that in time, with continued recovery, they will once again populate Hadaguay. But there is some local resistance to otters returning. There's a concern about what could happen when they, when they do return, because sea otters uh, are quite voracious eaters. They'll eat up just about anything in the kelp forest habitat. And as a result, they can compete with uh, the human fisheries for things like abalone and, um, and sea urchins. And so there's this uh, opportunity to uh, see, to try to use some mathematical modeling to see how a kelp forest could recover with the reintroduction of sea otters and what that would possibly mean for the humans who also rely on the kelp forest ecosystem. That's the voice of Dr. Jason Goldman, a science writer from Los Angeles who covered this fascinating story originally in Biographic. He explains why the loss of otters has impacted the ecosystem. Well, when sea otters are removed from the ecosystem, part of, uh, part of the role that sea otters play is they control sea urchins. So when you get rid of the otters... Uh, the sea urchin population uh, explodes because that's their primary predator. And the sea urchins then eat up all the kelp. And when the kelp disappears, you sort of lose the entire ecosystem because the kelp provides quite a lot of uh, habitat and uh, food for lots of other species as well. So part of the idea is uh, 
if we if if the sea otters can be reintroduced, then they can resuppress the urchin population. Kelp could begin to grow again, and the entire ecosystem could sort of right itself. It's not unlike the story with wolves in Yellowstone. You know, by reintroducing an apex predator, the entire ecosystem can sort of come back to uh, uh, some some version of of balance. Uh, and so that's uh, that's what they simulated. Uh, uh, rather than dump a bunch of sea otters in the area to see what happened, they uh, sent divers down into these urchin barrens uh, with hammers or really whatever tool they could use and swiftly dispatched a bunch of them to sort of simulate uh, the impact of otters on the urchin population. And the question is then, if you return to the same area that's deprived of its urchins, uh, what happens? Will the kelp regrow? And if the kelp regrows, will all of the other kelp forest species start to return? My understanding is that there was a benefit to the sea urchin population as well, which might not be uh, intuitively obvious when there, there is a simulation of predation on them. Yeah. So, um, so in an urchin barren setting, which is which is what these sort of otterless habitats look like. When the otters are first removed, uh, the sea urchins totally gorge on the kelp, but then there's no more kelp left to sustain the population. And so you get what uh, one of the researchers that I talked to called a, a population of zombie urchins. And these are urchins that have sort of found enough nutrition to survive, uh, but not really enough to uh, reproduce. So in, a, in an urchin barren, only the first few meters of urchins by the kelp line in the shallows uh, can eat enough to have, you know, uh, uh, to, to be reproductively viable, to have large uh, uh, gonads, uh, what, what you might see at a menu on, at a sushi restaurant referred to as uni. And that's because there's a thin sort of strip of kelp that grows in the shallows um, in water that's simply too shallow for the urchins to survive. And so the ones that exist right along that border can eat up plenty of kelp. But as soon as you get very much deeper, uh, these, are, these are urchins that just can't find enough nutrition. So they're alive, they, they, they survive, but they can't really reproduce. And so a population in a habitat with otters would certainly be smaller. There'd be fewer urchins around but uh, ostensibly they would be healthier urchins that are more uh, well-fed. This comment from Jason led me to wonder, with the potential of predation by sea otters improving the overall health of the sustaining sea urchins, it is interesting to consider if this would go some way to offsetting the obvious reduction in the overall population from otters returning. This dynamic will be a fascinating output from the research, given that most of the sea urchins which exist are currently in what Jason described as this zombie-like state, and largely unharvestable. Now, a question which is rarely asked when looking at any kind of reintroduction of a species is what does the long-term plans put in place if future populations are deemed to need controlled for the benefit of the ecosystem they are inhabiting? I put this to Jason. Has there been any discussion looking forward and projecting into the future when and if otters do reestablish a population as to any potential management that might have to be undertaken to control the otter population to balance the human interests in those areas? Yeah, so this is uh, something that's certainly being discussed. I think uh, in terms of Haida Gwaii at this point, it's still, it's, it's, it's too early to really say because they're still collecting this data to understand um, what what could happen, but the 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 folks there are looking towards other communities where otters have started to recover, uh, like in uh, Alaska, for for models of this. Um, and, and so you know, even though in the United States, as as marine mammals, otters are protected. Some of the native Alaskan communities are permitted a sustainable sort of controlled harvest of sea otters. And so uh, that, that's certainly one model that is being discussed that could potentially be employed in a place like Haida Gwaii. Um, and that's certainly, 
you know, one of the interesting things about these commercial fisheries, like the urchin fishery and the abalone fishery, is that they uh, became established in a world, you know, in, in, in ecosystems that were already free of the otters. So it was already sort of an artificially inflated population that they were exploiting. I was curious to know from Jason what the landscape would have looked like prior to the fur trade, and if there were any lessons that we could learn from the indigenous community there. Prior to the uh, the extirpation of otters, uh, the the indigenous communities, you know, including the Haida people, would have suppressed the otter population in certain areas, which would have allowed uh, all those food resources to increase, like you know, artificially. Um, but it would have been done in sort of this mosaic pattern uh, where the otters would have been suppressed in areas near human communities. Um, and then those communities would have moved uh, and the otters would have recovered in those previously exploited areas. That, that is a solution that I think could exist today. But, uh, you know, we, we, we are, we're, we're much better at killing things now than we were, than we were then. And so it would have to be done sort of with, I think, with a, a tremendous amount of oversight. Just finally, is there or are there any takeaways from the research that's being done, although I understand that it's not completed yet, that we possibly will be able to extrapolate out for other species and other instances where under the hands of humans we've uh, removed certain populations of certain species and areas and as a result of which had detrimental effects on the, the ecosystems in those places? I think the the, the there, there's a there there is a broader lesson here, and and you know what really struck me about this this work, um, you know, I, I, as I said, I thought this is going to be a fairly straightforward story about about this you know intervention, this this uh, research project, um, and it is. But I, what what I don't think I realized until I actually spent time in this place is the um, deep connection between the Haida people, this indigenous community, and and this ecosystem. You know, I think we we tend to think of humans as as apart from ecosystems, as superimposed onto the natural world. But the Haida people um really, really think of themselves as as a part of the ecosystem. And so it is reasonable to uh, to look to this ecosystem for food, and and that's that's in part why this study um, is is explicitly not just about uh, about biodiversity conservation. It's a it's a joint project between the Haida people and the Canadian government and a handful of NGOs and academic laboratories, and and so it is it is as much about nurturing food to grow as it is about uh, sort of biodiversity conservation the way we tend to talk about it. And I think as we, as, as we think about uh, conservation efforts uh, in other parts of the world, I think it uh, really makes a good deal of sense. And, and, and I think we ought to think about how, how the communities of people who uh, have, have uh, ancestral relationships with these ecosystems uh, think about think about these uh, species and these resources and these habitats and uh, not just to pay them lift service but to really create true partnerships between uh, what we might what we might sort of think of as western science and um, and these sort of more more traditional uh, ways of thinking about uh, about nature. This story was first published in Biographic.com, and the article, Restoring Harmony in Hadaguay, was written by Dr. Jason Goldman, who you've just been hearing from in this interview. You will find all of that information in the show notes. But that's it for now. Join me again in two weeks' time when we take another walk into the Anthropocene.